Hello and welcome to round six of the simple teachings of the revealed God. And today the topic is the divine logos, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. But just kind of focusing on the word of God, the logos of God. Uh, one of the favorite parts that I of our faith, one of the things of the faith that I really love is the intellectual tradition of the church. Uh, I thank God for my ability to kind of study and learn and kind of be educated. But, you know, a consolation is that there are other people that are smarter than me. I am not the first one to investigate this stuff. All the questions that I have, all the questions that the world has had, you know, someone has already done the investigation and all we got to do is just like check it out. Like what did, the, what did the geniuses of the past say? What are the holy saints who are gurus of, of the faith? What did they say? And we can kind of absorb that even today. All that writing is passed down. And what a gift that is. And I think that's one of the things of the faith that I really, really love. Again, today we're talking about the Logos. And this Logos gives us the capacity for the understanding of our faith, uh, even at least partially. And that is a great gift, that there is order and reason in the nature of God and in the nature of the universe. Let us begin with a prayer, and then we'll kind of review where we've already kind of talked about in the series. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and we bless you. You have given us your word, this meaning, this, this reason, this rationality that has entered into human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and the humanity that Mary gave to the word. Uh, what a blessing it is that we can look at him in a little crib. And in that little crib, he continues to be the eternal son of God. Lord, we ask that you help us to understand, come to a deeper knowledge of the truth of who you are, that we may fulfill in our lives your grace, your love, your beauty. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, just a little review. Uh, repetition is the mother of memory, as they say. Uh, where have we gone already? We have talked about God freely revealing himself to humanity. He doesn't have to, but he does. And he reveals himself as this other, this transcendent being, who is also love. And in fact, he makes himself small so that he can love us even more. We can even kind of consider this to be condescending transcendence, or maybe transcending condescension. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is who God is. We get a glimpse of that in the Trinity. We get a glimpse of the persons of the Trinity, the nature of the Father and Son relationship from which comes the Holy Spirit. You know, we even get this stamped into creation, and that's a beautiful thing. And the reason why we get this stamped into creation is because creation has an ordered dimension to it. And that comes from the ordered dimension within God, if you can kind of put it into words like that. That, that comes up far, sh far short of the truth, but it kind of points to the fact that in God, all things make sense. It is all reasonable. He is all truth. So let's just dive in. When I say the word logos, what the heck am I talking about here? Logos is word. It is a word. In the Greek language, it means, it means uh, well, just that word. It can also mean a number of different things. It can mean a discourse, a speech. It can mean meaning. It can mean, uh, let's see, an accounting. Like, I'm going to tell you something. Well, you're going to give me a logos. You know, how did it go yesterday? Oh, i got something to tell you. Well, let me give you a logos of how it went. This becomes very relevant in John chapter... Oh, one, right at the beginning of John 1. And the reason why that is is because he just talks about the word. This is how he begins. This is how he introduces Jesus. It's very profound. But he doesn't talk about it out of context at all. He talks about it within the Jewish tradition. Now, that Jewish tradition has really two parts I want to speak of. The first is the word, word, <laughs> the word logos in Hebrew is debar. The second dimension of the context is the, the tradition of wisdom that they have. So the word debar, that means word, but it means something more than word. A little bit more like how we would use it in this sentence. 
I give you my word that I will not jump upside down, do backflip at a twist, something like that. I don't know. But I give you my word. It commits a person. It commits a, the, the person to another. It provides fidelity. It provides trust. It provides uh, even a certain sense of promise. I give you my word. And as I speak this word, I'm giving you something of myself. This is sometimes kind of put side to side with the word of God, or rather the, uh, the name of God. I am who I am. You know, that's the word that we don't pronounce, the Hebrew version, because that's the most profound revelation of who God is in the Old Testament. And just in reverence of that, we use the translation or we use the word Lord. So we can say that God gave us the Lord word, kind of that compound word there. Lord word. And in this Lord word, he speaks of himself. This Lord word is a dynamic, active communication of God's purpose and plan. Part of the context is also drawing from the wisdom tradition in the Old Testament. Uh, wisdom is personified as a woman. And there are beautiful, beautiful parts of of the Old Testament that really are very poetic, that very much speak of her as a this woman, this lady. I had a professor in seminary, a priest, a mentor priest, and he always talked about lady wisdom in, in kind of a little bit more romantic terms than I would talk about her. But, uh, that, I mean, it's, it's right there in Scripture. I mean, he was drawn from Scripture. It, it made sense. And the Greek word for this wisdom is Sophia. You know, it's a name, sure. But Sophia means wisdom. However, and this is where the word philosophy comes from. It's the word, it's the love of wisdom. Philo meaning love. Sophia coming uh, into that uh, philosophy part. So, that's the context. And now we have the Gospel of John. So let me, let me read from you the prologue. We call this first chapter the prologue because it, it's not really part of the story it's kind of like a pre-story, a prehistory of what's going on there. And it really is a prehistory because it even is before any history, before the creation. In the beginning was the Word. Already in that, in the beginning, we're thrown back into Genesis before there is creation. So in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. So there's three dimensions of this that I really want to speak of, and there's just these few little verses here. The first is, the word was with God, and that word with, I think, really speaks to a distinction within God, that there's God, but there's also the word, and they can be distinguished, they can be distinct from each other. Now, this can be a little confusing considering the next verse. And the word was God. Well, is it with God or was God? Well, we know in the Trinity we have distinction even within total unity, where the word is actually good. All Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are totally God, but yet they are distinct in their relationships. And so the word is distinct within God, but he's also totally fully God. So those are the two poles there that I want to mention. The third thing that I want to mention from these, these verses is the dynamic of the word being an essential part of creation. When God acts, all three persons of the Trinity act, and creation is no different. Uh, you know, if, if I had two beings, if I had two persons in my being, uh, if I was, a, what do you call it, schizophrenic, well, if I do something, both of my personalities are doing it. That's a bad metaphor for what God is. But when God acts, the Father is acting in that moment, the Son is acting in that moment, the Holy Spirit is acting in the moment. And sometimes we have, uh, through the revelation, revelation we have in Scripture, we associate an act with a particular person. But at the same hand, we must also say that the whole of the Trinity is there acting. So, in this sense, God is creating but also God is creating through the word. Nothing came to be without the word. That is pretty important. 
We're going to hit on a lot of practical applications uh, in the last part of this talk here. But the first of these is really the, the sense that we are created by reason, by the logos, by logic, by understanding, by meaning. And our whole being, the whole being in the universe, but especially the being of humanity, really exudes order. So we're, we're going to hop into that a little later here. Now, that's part of the prologue of the Gospel of John. That's just the first three verses or so. Now I'm going to jump forward to verse 14, still in the prologue. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory. Like the glory of the eternal word became human. Wow, like that's insane. How the heck can you have eternity in something that is time-bound and space-bound? I don't know, but it happened. <laughs> and this is just another word to describe that. The word became flesh. The word became flesh. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, Pope Benedict, well, I guess before he became, yeah, well, Pope Benedict in a homily, he, he alludes to uh, a Greek translation of the Old Testament in which we hear the words, God made his word short. He abbreviated it. And this is kind of how he describes the incarnation. You know, there's the eternal word speaking from all eternity, never mm -hmm. having a beginning, never having an end. But yet, and that's a lot to say, I will say. But at the same hand, he abbreviated it. He made it short. Still maintaining the fullness of it, what it is, but at the same hand, making it acceptable to us. Uh, making it accessible. Maybe that's a little bit better word for that. Making the inaccessible accessible. Making, uh, entering humans into this divine dialogue dialogue coming from the word logos, dialogos, uh, to have a word across, to speak to another. Logos, dialogue. Now it's a dialogue with humanity. It's not just a dialogue within God. Now God is speaking to us through the word. That word is being addressed to us. And to make it accessible is really the key mission of Jesus Christ. This is also the key mission of all of his believers. You know, Jesus is the mission, as we kind of talked about last time. He's the mission of God. He's pure. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked upon and touched with our hands. I and mean, this is talking all this tangible stuff here. This is not like an abstract being at all. This concerns the word of life. For the life was made visible. So it's kind of a proclamation there. And then he says what he's doing. We have seen it and testified to it. We've had the experience, and we're sharing that experience with you. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us, that you may have fellowship with the Father. Boom! Like, I love that. that this, that's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture there, in all honesty. I, I stumbled upon it in January, and I was like, oh my gosh, that is beautiful. That is it was really fulfilling what I'm talking about, where the love that I have experienced and known and intuited and the connection with God that I can't rip myself apart from, that's the same thing that I'm handing on, passing on, in that we might have fellowship with one another. It's not complicated, is it? And so we have this eternal dialogue with God. Father spoke his eternal word in human language. It's pretty dang amazing. So now I'm going to get into a number of practical points here. Uh, i got a nice little s uh, selection of practical takeaways from considering Jesus Christ as the eternal logos, the eternal word. As all words are spoken to someone, I mean, sometimes we talk to ourselves, but even, even that is to someone, it's back to ourself. <laughs> well, when God became flesh in the word of God, he addressed the word to us. That's a big deal. And if we, and that really affects who we are, because this was destined from all eternity. And if we were destined from all eternity to have this word directed to us, that means that we are destined from all eternity to be hearers of the word, to be listeners of the word. So brothers and sisters, really give the word a good listen to. 
he has actual words. He's made himself human. He, he, this, we can hear his words in Scripture. We need to be diving into Scripture on a regular, daily, daily basis to find the revelation that God is offering to us, to enter into this daily divine dialogue, dialogos, this, to, to have this word that goes across this boundary of eternity into our hearts. And from our hearts back across, we speak a word back to him, a dialogue, a dialogos, back to the Lord. And this is a creative word. Let's not forget that. So as we receive it and we hear it, as it enters into us, this word transforms us. And we were created at our conception, but because sin, we've been deteriorated in a number of ways. But receiving this word recreates us, makes us fresh. So this is the first takeaway, that we are eternally hearers of the word, eternally destined to be hearers of the word. The second big takeaway is that we have something of the logos, of the eternal logos, of the eternal ordering and reasoning in us because we were made in the image and likeness of God. We are created wisely, and we are created with a rational order. We are not created haphazardly, but we are created with a real ordering. And following that ordering leads to fulfillment, flourishing, happiness, beatitude, peace, joy, however you want to describe that. Like, it's great. It's awesome. Like, there's nothing else worth, there's nothing worth doing in addition to that. This is the fulfillment. When we, we have... The ordering is within us. It doesn't come to us from outside. It is from our being because we are created with it. And it is so much a part of us that as we have our moments of rebelling against that ordering, it makes us unhappy because we're going against our own being. It is irrational <laughs> to go against our ordering. That is a part of who we are. And this following of that order is what we call ethical living, moral living. And the study of that ordering is what we call morality or ethics. Remember when we talked about creation, I think maybe two times ago, two or three times ago, we talked about the ten words of creation where God said just that. God said blah, 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 blah. He said that ten times in the creation account. And these were the ten logos the Decalogos, the Decalogue of creation. Now we have the Decalogue. This is what we call the Ten Commandments in, in tradition. We have the Decalogue, which are now the ten words of human and society ordering, where human and society are created and established and find their peace and harmony within this, this ordering. And it just makes clear the ordering. So any kind of ethical or morality, uh, moral system, that does not use this ordering, this gift of the gift that God gives us of communicating this order to us, well, then it's going to go astray. It's off. It's wrong. But God is very merciful to us. He says, you know what? You kind of get some idea here, but humans, I'm just going to tell you the basics of human ordering. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Love God above all things. And things will be all right. So that is the 10 words of moral ordering, kind of paralleling with the 10 words of creation ordering. I love that parallel. I think that's really beautiful and very profound. These are the 10 keys of order for human flourishing, for the flourishing of society. The third of these practical takeaways is that, you know, we, practically speaking, we're very concerned with meaning. I don't want to do things that are totally dumb pointless, useless. I want to be engaged with things that have real meaning. And the best thing about it is the word logos has the sense, has one of the meanings, the word meaning. <laughs> I got a lot of uh, parallels here today where I use the, uh, I introduce the definition with the definition. That might be more confusing than not. But the meaning of the word logos is meaning. And so the meaning of the world, of the universe became flesh the meaning of the world is Jesus Christ incarnate. That's a huge stinking deal. Like, that's big. 
Like people are like, oh, what the heck is the meaning of the world? Well, it's Jesus Christ and doing everything that he says and working and living and loving all for him. There's nothing else that has any meaning. He is the divine ordering of humanity. He, he lives it and he characterizes it. He is the model for us, but also in his words, he is the teacher of us. And as the savior, he is the, the one who points to meaning beyond this universe towards an eternal realm, the kingdom of heaven. Just to give you a little story here, stories are kind of fun. In this series, I really haven't given you too many stories here, I don't think. Oh, oh got a sneeze, hold on. Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's not coming. Ooh, all right, that's past. This is the story of St. Justin Martyr. Uh, Justin, before he was a saint, before he was a Christian, he was a philosopher, and he had a real love of wisdom. He was a traveler, and he just went around asking people for their wisdom, and he hunted it out. He sought it out. He was hungry and thirsty for, for it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, think about that. For they shall be satisfied. Well, he was satisfied. He found the true philosophy and the revelation that was Jesus Christ. And he found in Christianity a real shortcut to divine wisdom. And he gave all of his life to it. Like he gave all of his life to it in a, in a real experiential way by becoming Christian, but he gave all of his life to it because he was a martyr. Like he gave his blood, he gave up his whole earthly existence for the sake of the eternal existence, the heavenly existence, because he found, you know, that pearl of great price. He sold it all for it. He found it all and he's, he's all in. And uh, I just love that story. So we could kind of describe Christianity, Christianity as the true philosophy the true rational religion. Nothing contradicts reason. Nothing contradicts our experience. All things in the religion of Christianity are ordered in accordance with the truth, both theological and philosophical and science. However, we should probably say that Christianity does not teach the truths of science. And also, it doesn't necessarily teach the truths of philosophy, though there might be a lot of parallels, especially in how we live and perhaps some elements of, I don't know, that might be a little bit too much speculation for me right now. But Christianity definitely speaks of philosophical ethics. It has real things to say about that. So just kind of recap, I got a few more practical takeaways here. The first practical takeaway was that we are hearers of the word. And then it was that our, our living needs to be in accordance with the ordering that is that is our being that create that we are created in. This third practical takeaway was that Jesus is the meaning of everything. The fourth is, is that Christianity is naturally open to all things that are true. What does St. Paul say? I don't know if I can quote it exactly. He says, whatever is true, whatever is beautiful, whatever is good, whatever is peaceful, etc., 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 these are yours. This is what he is addressing to the people he's writing to. You know, hunt those things out. Whatever's good, true, beautiful, make it yours. Adopt it. So this might be things of culture. Obviously, there are things in our culture, as in any culture, that are unhelpful, that are unhealthy, that can really harm the soul. But there are also things that are good, and we need to adopt that and not cast them aside. Same thing with philosophy. Some philosophers are wrong. Those are not for us. There are some philosophers who are correct and right and, and have discovered the truth of natural reason, and we need to adopt these. Or think about art. You know, there's some art that is actually be uh, beautiful and glorious, and we need to say, like, yeah, that, yeah, we're going to claim that. That's Christian art right there. Oh, yeah. And it might just be a landscape or something like that, or a tree, or a cow, or, or uh, a mother and child, or whatever it is. We adopt that. Now, there's other art out there that is, I don't know, I guess they're just uh, triumphing ugliness, <laughs> or, or the grotesque, or just... It's not really art. It's more like just kind of geographical shapes. You know, we don't, 
if there's any truth in that, then we adopt it. And if there's not anything in that, then we just say like, no thanks. Adios amigo. That's okay. So we adopt all that is good, true, and beautiful. And we, we just love it. We absorb it. And that's a part of our Christian inheritance. It's part of the inheritance of humanity. The f- fifth takeaway here is that we can be at peace with not knowing all the details all of all the mysteries. We are, it's very clear that there are mysteries in this world. Why in the world do some people follow God and other people do not? I do not get that, and I really wish I did. Why is there suffering of the innocent, of children? Why do some people not suffer? How does the death of Jesus Christ affect us at all? Like, what, How the heck does that happen? I don't get that. I don't get it. Maybe a little bit, but I don't get it a whole, month, whole lot. Uh, you know, you got your own mysteries in your own life. You know, what the heck is the Trinity? We can describe it in different ways, but what in the world's going on there? It's very difficult to explain. So, there are things that we can't know. Yes, these are what we call mysteries. But at the same hand, we believe that all these mysteries are connected with the Logos. That there is a deeper ordering and reasoning within them that's simply inaccessible to us. But yet we have access to it all through the Logos, through the Word, through God Almighty, through access to Him. These things don't have to be known in all of its details. Uh, so we can say, God, I don't, I don't get why they're suffering. I don't get why this little kid is suffering so much. That this does not make sense to me. But we can also say that, well, God is all, all reasonable, God must have a bigger plan, that God has structured the universe in such a way that all things work towards the good. And we can be at peace with that, that God is going to bring bring it all to him, that it's all going to be worked out. That's good news. Like, that's really good news. It's a jump of faith. I'm not laying out, I guess, an argument about how we can explain the existence of evil in the world. I think that's a worthy enterprise, and people have done that uh, to a, to a real degree. Though there's always something lacking there. There's always the dark side of that mystery that we cannot know. But there's a little bit of light shine shown on that mystery as well. But at the same hand, on that dark side there, the unknowing part of it, we just got to say like, God, it's in your hands. You are all reasonable. I trust in you. You're all good. That's what we call trusting in God, finding peace in trust. So the sixth and final of these practical takeaways is that this mystery is lovable. Hey, hey, because it's, it's the word. It, God came down to us. The word became flesh. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, or you could say word. God so loved the word that he, world that he gave his only word to the world so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. He loves us. This mystery of the divine reality is desirable, it is good, it is perfectly lovable. And it's kind of neat because it's knowable. Not totally in this world, our, our minds are too small to get at that. But in a real way, it, it is. When we, and we can pursue knowledge of God, for love of God. One of the Psalms has this little phrase here, seek his face. This is the encouragement of, of King David as he's writing these Psalms. Seek his face, get to know him, get to know him and get to love him even more. Let your love for him throw you into getting to know him more and let getting to know him more throw you back into a deeper love for him. This is kind of the flow. Uh, The word theology, St. Anselm, no, St. Amber, yeah, St. Anselm, I get my my saints would start with an A all mixed up. St. Anselm describes theology as faith, seeking, understanding. I believe this, but I want to know more. Theology is a pursuit of love. I want to seek the face of God. I'm hungry for it. I want to know him more. Otherwise, theology becomes intellectual pride. You know, no one says that I want to get one up on God, but at the same hand, we're, we kind of are saying, you know, if I can get, bo- if I can get God into this little box here, 
and kind of have all my understandings totally totally wrap wrap him up in that well you know that's that's not god then <laughs> if we're able to understand it it's not god that's a wisdom piece from saint augustine if you know it if you understand it it's not god if it continues to be mysterious well that's a lot more likely to be god and that's a mystery that can be known in jesus christ but known more in a, in a relational way and perhaps in a in a partial intellectual way but definitely mostly relational so again just to kind of give a little review here the word became flesh the word is with god distinct from god it's a distinction within god of a relationship but it's also god himself and that god himself who is the word became a human being we're created through this word and that Creation gives us an ordering by which we can follow him. And we see him become very humble for us. We are listeners of the word. Our being, because it was created from him, has a rational ordering to him. That's what we call ethics. Jesus Christ is the meaning of the universe. Our religion is open to all that is true and good and beautiful. <coughs> because the Logos, we're a religion of the Logos made flesh. And all that is good and true and beautiful has the stamp of the Logos on it. And we can have peace in not knowing all the ins and outs of the mysteries of God. That's all right. And in fact, we can love that. And that love for these mysteries, we say, with that love for God, needs to just lead us into a deeper pursuit of his face. Who is God? I want to get to know God. I want to know him. I want to love him. I want to serve him all the more. That's probably why you're watching this, if you watched it all the way to the end or listened to it. And I hope this has been fruitful. Uh, I love putting these together, and I'll keep on going. So the next time, we will, uh, let's see here, we'll talk about a little bit of the history of the church, how the history, uh, all the bishops and those councils of the early church really came to a deeper knowledge and understanding of the triune God, three persons in one divine nature. It's, a, it's quite a story, so we'll, we'll dive on into that. It'll be great. All right, God bless you all. Talk to you soon. Bye.